Today I wanted to talk to you about perhaps one of the most serious problems in the world. It is really the only formidable objection to God's existence. The only one that atheists have come up with that is serious, that demands answers. It is on the top of the list why those who doubt or deny his existence do so. People have lost their faith and therefore their souls for not finding a satisfactory answer to these problems, to this problem. The problem I am referring to is the so-called problem of evil, the problem of suffering and pain in this world. Something that we not only know about, but something that we have felt personally. The problem can be summed up in the following questions. If God is all good, why is the world so evil? If he is the creator of the world, isn't he the cause of evil? If God created and rules the world with so-called infinite wisdom and power, why does it seem that he's doing such a miserable job at it? If he truly forbids evil, can't he enforce his own laws? How can we believe that there is an all-loving, all-good, all-merciful, all-just, and all-powerful God if there is so much seemingly senseless evil in the world, so much gratuitous pain and suffering? We can understand the justice of why bad things happen to bad people, but why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the innocent suffer? And lastly, St. Augustine posed this famous dilemma. If God is all good and all powerful, why doesn't he take away the sufferings of the world? If he cannot, then he wouldn't be all powerful. And if he will not, then how can he be all good? Probably most of us have asked ourselves these very same questions at one moment in our life. Why? These are indeed great mysteries and only God can fully comprehend himself and his actions. But perhaps this morning I can shed just a little bit of light on the problem. First of all, we need to understand what evil is. What is evil? What we must understand is that evil does not exist of itself and by itself. I do not mean by this that evil is not real or that it is a, an illusion of the mind. What I mean is that evil is not a thing, and not a being, not something that has positive and independent existence. If evil were a thing, then God would be to blame for evil because God is the creator of all things, all beings. But as Genesis tells us, after God created the universe, he said it was good. And it is. Matter is good. Matter is not evil. It cannot be evil. Therefore, evil was not created by God, for evil is no thing. It is nothing. Yet it is very real. It has real as the holes in your head. I mean, your mouth or your nostrils. In other words, evil is a negation, a lack of being. As darkness is the lack or the absence of light, or a hole is the absence of material in that specific place. Evil is like a parasite. It always needs a host body to infect, to corrupt, as it were, a good to frustrate. But evil is not simply an absence, it is the privation of what should be there. For example, the fact that we do not have wings and can't fly is not an evil for us, as much as we would like to fly. We were not meant to fly. 
But it would be an evil, a physical evil for a bird not to have wings and not to fly. And this is how we must understand moral evil. In itself, it is not a thing. You cannot have a cup of evil or a box of sin. It is not a thing. It is rather a negation, a disorder, a rupture, a violation of the divine law. The physical act in a sin is not what makes a sin evil. It's the disorder. It is going against what God wants, the order that he set up. So clearly there are two kinds of evil in this world. There is moral evil, namely sin and selfishness and the like. And then there is physical evil, pain and suffering of either mind or body. But the real evil in this world is not suffering, but sin. Pain and suffering are called physical evils, but they're only relatively evil. They're not evil as such. They are only, they're not incompatible with a good God. In fact, pain and suffering can serve very good purposes, as we shall see. I think to understand the mystery of suffering in the world, we have to understand that in a universe such as we have it, such as God created it, with all its laws and different kinds of beings, different degrees of creatures, There must be some kind of suffering and death since the universe is in a continual process of change, of growth, of movement towards a perfection that it does not have. Each being in the universe, each law has its own nature, its own reason for existing. And sometimes these reasons clash, sometimes these purposes clash. And in these continual conflicts, conflicts, you will inevitably get suffering, decay and death. That is just the way the universe is. For God to change all this, to take away all this suffering in the world, would be to completely change the whole universe as he created it, as we know it. But we can see, in fact, in this, an important law of reality, and even a law of the spiritual life. That for imperfect creatures, life is obtained through death. That in order for something to live and grow, something in a sense has to die. The lower order order of beings were made for the higher. Matter and minerals are consumed by the plant and transformed into the plant. But the minerals have to die, in a sense, to their own nature. They have, to be, they have to give themselves out and surrender themselves to the plant, as the plant has to surrender itself and be changed into animal. And animals were made for man and are changed, as it were, into man. And finally, man was made for God. And man must die to himself to live for God, to become, as it were, like to God. This is the law of reality. Let me give a few more examples. For the earth and all its creatures to live and flourish, they must receive light and heat and warmth from the sun. The sun is giving its energy to us. The sun is literally burning itself out, dying for us, slowly. But that's the way it is. In the animal kingdom, a cheetah Eating a gazelle would be a good thing for the cheetah, but a bad thing for the gazelle. Take a disease. The germ or bacteria or cancer is good or bad, depending upon the way you look at it. Since the the germ or the cancer has a life of its own, has an existence, in that sense it is good. But it's not good for you if it's attacking you. So that's why... Evil is the negation. It's not something you can have hold in your hand. This is just the way the universe is. There's going to be clashes between these different forces. And God lets nature take its course. He lets the laws he created produce their own effects. And in the process of this, suffering has to exist. 
So we see why it just has to be this way in a universe such as we have it. But originally, however, human beings were not intended to feel physical pain or suffering. And where did it come from? Well, sin is the origin of suffering, at least <clears throat> for us poor humans. We all know well the story of Genesis. Adam and Eve were created immune from pain. And our humanity was meant to keep this special gift of freedom of pain. Yet because our first parents lost it, we lost it also in them. Since they were the source of all humanity, they could not give what they did not have. They were like a fountain poisoned at the source. It is not, original sin is not a positive sin on our soul, it's a lack of something that should be there. Original sin and all our personal subsequent sins of all humanity is really the cause of the majority of the sufferings of humanity. Every prison, hospital, orphanage, poorhouse, food bank, insane asylum, old age home, every battle, world war, every coffin and grave, every heartache and heartbreak and headache is due to sin. That's the consequences. But couldn't God stop all this? Isn't he omnipotent, all-powerful? Yes, he is. But what does omnipotence mean? It means the power to do all things. It does not mean the power to do nonsense, to do a contradiction. He cannot, even God cannot make a triangle with four sides. So God cannot give you free will and not make you free at the same time. If you are free to choose good, that implies the necessity that you are free to choose evil. That's what freedom means. And so God himself is not able to take away all the evil from the world without at the same time taking back the great and powerful gift of free will. But he respects our freedom too much. And so evil must exist in a sense. God did not want slaves or robots, but free agents. He wanted children who would freely choose him, freely love him. He did not want a forced love or service. Who would want a forced love? Love must be free. The key to the whole problem is given us by St. Augustine, who wrote, God would not allow any evil to exist unless out of it he could draw a greater good. This is part of the wisdom and goodness of God. This is what he wrote. So what is our true good? What is our true and only good? Well, clearly it's God. The chief purpose of life is not earthly happiness. It is to know, love, and serve God, and thereby obtain union with him, now and forever. And in this we will find our true happiness. But God's solution to the problem of suffering is as big and as clear as the Son. It is the Son, the Son of God, our Savior Jesus Christ. God in his infinite power, wisdom and goodness could not have drawn a greater good from evil than the Incarnation. Through the Incarnation, death and resurrection of Christ, God was able to reveal something which he could not have done unless sin and suffering existed. That he was willing to suffer and die and by this reveal and prove, prove to us how much he loved us. That his love was of infinite depths. It was love pushed to the limits. God himself could not even have done more than what he did. So God did not get off the hook for allowing evil in the world. In fact, he suffered more for it, more than you have ever suffered or will suffer. So that is the point of the crucifix. He died so that we may live. He sanctified, and this is important, 
He sanctified our suffering and death, turning the greatest curse into the greatest blessing, into the greatest means to holiness, into the very road to heaven. What became our punishment became the latter. One of the reasons why the sufferings and trials of this earth can be so puzzling to many of us is that we think the purpose of life is happiness and contentment in this world. We tend to see God's role as to provide a comfy and cozy environment for his human pets. We tend to see, excuse me, we are not God's pets, we are his children. And he wants us to come home. This is not our true home. But he will not force us. This life is simply the vestibule of heaven. And we choose whether we want to go in to our true home or not. We can leave out or go in. But he does not want us to get too comfortable in this life. He doesn't, doesn't want us to settle down on the road, on the journey, lest we forget the whole purpose of our existence. Above all, God desires to help us to avoid that greatest of evils, hell, which is only evil eternalized. Since there is free will, since there is evil, and since there is eternity, there must be a hell. You must be free to choose evil for all eternity. And that's really what this life is. If the sinner has chosen evil during life and dies in unrepented, serious sin, then God respects the freedom. You can choose to live without me. That's what you want. A sinner receives no more chances because they have had enough chances after death. God is wise and he knows that even if I gave you another million chances, you would not take it. So this life is the testing ground. Since our true home is the eternity of heaven, our true happiness is found only in God, he does all he can to continually remind us of this truth, to wake us up to the truth of our mortality, sinfulness, and utter need of him. Suffering and trials are the spiritual alarm clock to wake us up from our spiritual slumber. On this note, I must quote the famous Christian writer C.S. Lewis from his masterpiece, The Problem of Pain. He writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts, shouts at us in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. No doubt, pain as God's megaphone is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepented rebellion, but it gives the only opportunity the bad man can have for amendment. It removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the fortress of a rebel soul. There are many reasons for suffering. One is, it is the way we make atonement for sins, and who has not sinned? and therefore deserved all the suffering he or she gets in this life. All the little suffering, really. What is sin? Sin is the choosing of a created thing or pleasure in opposition to God. And therefore, it is not only just that our punishment for sin <coughs> is to suffer from creatures. If we have ever committed a mortal sin in our life, even just one, and we know this, this is catechism, we have deserved hell. Eternal separation from God. But if God, in his mercy, has forgiven us, and he has, time and time and again, it's only just that some penance must be made through mortification and the patient bearing of life's trials. That's, how you, that's the greatest way to make penance, to do penance for your sins, is to patiently bear what, he set, what providence allows into your life. That's really what the passion of Christ is. Passion means passive suffering. So your life is meant to be a passion. 
It is actually a very healing experience to willingly suffer in this life for our misdeeds. We instinctively feel that we should not get away with it. We need to make amends. We need to pay back to God the love which we took from Him and wrongly placed in, in creatures. So suffering can be and is meant to be a, a healing instrument in the hands of the divine physician. Spiritual health and growth demands the increasing destruction of that corrupt nature in us, which is the result of original sin. And the cross of Christ is really just the instrument, the scalpel for this divine surgery, which serves to mortify, and mortify means to put to death that unhealthy life in, within us, that unhealthy cancerous growth in the spiritual order, which conflicts with the mind and intentions of God and his life within us. And so the daily sufferings of life, born in union with the cross of Christ, bring life through death. This is the law of reality. In order something to live, something must die. Our spiritual life or the life of grace will be in exact proportion to the death of the self in us, which is opposed to God. For whomsoever, said our divine Savior, will save his life, shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel shall save it. And another point we must always remember is that some of our sufferings, perhaps most of the sufferings of the innocent, why do the innocent suffer? May not be meant merely for our own good, but for the good of others. At the heart of Christianity is the deep mystery of vicarious atonement. The suffering for others, my life for yours, to appease God's justice, to win his mercy and grace, the conversion of a sinful soul, the salvation of souls. Others need your sufferings. So don't be selfish. Don't object. So God does not want us to become content and satisfied with the little pleasures of this life, even the innocent ones. Elsewhere, C.S. Lewis writes, and I have to quote him a few times because he says some really profound things on this topic. He writes, Everyone has noticed how hard it is to turn our thoughts to God when everything is going well with us. We have, we have all we want is a terrible saying when all does not include God. We find God an interruption. As St. Augustine says somewhere, God wants to give us something, but he, can't, but he can't, because our hands are full. There's nowhere for him to put it. Or as a friend of mine said, we regard God as an airman regards his parachute. It's there for emergencies, but he hopes he'll never have to use it. Now God who has made us knows what we are and that our happiness lies in him. Yet we will not seek it in him as long as he leaves us any other resort where we can even possibly be looked for. While what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. We all know from experience that sometimes pain must be inflicted for a greater good. As a doctor must hurt in order to heal. It is bitter medicine, but necessary to swallow. Suffering is meant to be medicinal. Our human nature is like a broken arm that was set wrong. It needs to be, in a sense, broken again and set right. And that's painful. Not to administer a cure in such a case would have been cruel of God. But thank goodness that God is love and not L-U-V love. God is a consuming fire, a burning furnace of charity. God is a most loving father. 
And as a loving parent would do, he must punish in order to correct. Love does not mean to let the loved one do whatever he or she pleases. For true love means to effectively desire the true good of the beloved, even at the cost of pain. One who loves does not does what he, he or she can to correct and help the loved one, to bring that loved one to perfection. And becoming perfect implies change, and change hurts. Love hurts. This is tough love. When we, when we rebel against God for allowing sufferings in our life, when we pray that he be more loving with us, more kind in our regard, what we are actually asking for is not more love from God, but less. Don't be so loving to me. Again, I must quote C.S. Lewis. These words are priceless. By the goodness of God, we mean nowadays almost exclusively his lovingness. And in this, we may be right. And by love, in this context, most of us mean kindness. The desire to see others than the self happy. Not happy in this way or that, but just happy. What would really satisfy us would be a God who said, anything we happened to like doing, what does it matter as long as they are contented? We want, in fact, not so much a father in heaven as a grandfather in heaven. A senile benevolence who, as they say, like to see young people enjoying themselves. And whose plan for the universe was simply that it might be truly said at the end of each day, a good time was had by all. Not many people, I admit, would formulate a theology in precisely those terms. But a conception not very different lurks at the back of many minds. I do not claim to be an exception. I should very like, I'd very much like to live in a universe which was governed on such lines. But since it is abundantly clear that I don't, and since I have reason to believe, nevertheless, that God is love, I conclude that my conception of love needs correction. And those are very wise words. We do not judge God by our conception of love, but we should judge ourselves by his conception of love. We are, as it were, a vessel of clay in the hands of the divine potter. And this is a, an analogy that was God himself used in the Old Testament in the prophecy of Jeremiah. So God must have his hands all over you, molding you, shaping you, squashing you down if necessary because he's molding you into a beautiful piece of art. Now, if the clay were conscious, they would say, ouch, don't touch me so much. What are you doing to me? Be kinder to me, be more gentle. But the potter would reply that it was precisely because he loves you, that he wants to make you into something precious and priceless, that he has to mold you, has to cause you some pain, has to make you see that your peace lies in his hands and in his will for you. As Abba Chapman writes, in fact, we are always in touch with God. Everything that happens is his arrangement, his providence, and the means of grace. A push onto heaven. Only most people try to go their own way, and so they put obstacles to God, God's action. All the sufferings and trials of life are not always good, but they're only good for those who love God, as the scripture said. Suffering can either make you bitter or make you better. They make a bad man worse or a good man holier. It all depends on how you accept it. But there is nothing like suffering to purify and to increase our love for God. Without suffering, it would be merely, nearly impossible to bring our life, love of God, to its utmost. Unless we have some opposition, we will not exert our will. We are lazy. The value 
of an act of suffering is not because of the pain as such, but because the soul has to exert itself, has to struggle to believe, to hope, to trust, and to love. And by this struggle, it stretches the soul. It increases the capacity for love. And that is a very important reason why suffering, suffering exists. Plus, when we are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, the soul is more likely to act from a real supernatural motive, since we have to struggle to serve God. If everything goes according to our own likes and wishes, how do we know that we truly love God? How do we know that we really want His will and are not just doing what we're doing because we happen to like it? We must have our times of desolation and trial, writes Abbot Chapman. How can we show our love for God except by enduring? He showed his love for us by suffering. Besides, it is such trials that make us humble. We begin to see there is no good in us, no devotion, no stability in good. That must make us see that God is everything. There are so many different aspects of this problem of suffering, but it, clearly we can't get into all of them. I hope I, perhaps I have not shed as much light as I was hoping to, but to a large extent, we can never know the full reason why God allows or sends this or that suffering to that particular soul. But who said we need to know all the answers? Who said God has promised us all these answers? At least not in this life. If animals cannot understand us, then there's no way we're going to understand completely the infinite God. Our puny minds could never comprehend the big picture that God sees. God is, and I'm sure you heard this analogy, and I'll close with this analogy, that God is building a tapestry, making a tapestry, and we're on the wrong side of the tapestry. We see all the knotted strings and loose ends, but he sees the picture on the other side. It doesn't make sense to us. It's only in heaven when we got on his side that we will understand why he put darkness there and light here and the different degrees of shading the different degrees of suffering in our life. But it's not for this life. All we can do in this life is to completely abandon ourselves to Him. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. But one thing we do know, His thoughts are loving thoughts. And His ways are always full of mercy and goodness. <clears throat>